Good evening, everyone, and welcome. It's great to see so many of you here tonight for tonight's talk with Naomi Klein and Ishmael Darrow. Um, give it up for yourselves for being here. So, um, my name's Kathleen McLean. I'm a programmer here at the AGO. And when we gather, we begin by considering the land um, that we're on and the responsibilities we have as either guests or perhaps hosts on this territory and our responsibility as treaty people. The AGO operates on land that is territory of the Anishinaabe Nation and was also the territory of the Haudenosaunee and the Wendat. The Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant is an agreement between the Anishinaabe Three Fires Confederacy and the Haudenosaunee Confederacy to peaceably share and care for the resources around the Great Lakes. Toronto is also governed by a treaty between the federal government of Canada and the Mississaugas of the Credit Anishinaabe Nation. And it's always been a trading center for First Nations. So tonight's talk is part of AGO Futures, which is an expansive range of artist, author, thinker, curator talks that examine urgent issues inspiring artists working today and what issue could be more urgent than the one we're gonna hear about this evening. I'm gonna give you the lay of the land. This is how it's gonna go. Um, we're going to begin with a video by Naomi Klein and The Intercept called The Message from the Future. Then Naomi Klein will speak right here. Then she'll be joined in conversation with Ishmael Darrow here. Then she's going to be signing books back there at a table at the back of the room. We also are selling books over there. Another story bookshop. Thank you. Um, if you haven't found a book, go for it. That's really what's going to happen. Um, I'm also going to introduce the speakers in a second. I'd also like to thank um, Sharon Cook and everyone at Penguin Random House Canada for helping make this fantastic event happen. So I know you all know this, but I'm just going to tell you that Naomi Klein is a public intellectual whose explorations of social, economic, and ecological injustice have made her a global thought leader. Her books include The Shock Doctrine, No Logo, This Changes Everything, and No Is Not Enough. Klein is the inaugural Gloria Steinem Endowed Chair in Media, Culture, and Feminist Studies at Rutgers University and co-founder of the climate justice organization, The Leap. Ishmael Darrow is a Canadian writer, editor, and podcaster based in New York, where he's the digital editor at the TV news hour, Democracy Now. He previously worked at BuzzFeed News and Post Media, and his work has appeared in Vice, Slate, and elsewhere on the internet and beyond. So with that, we're going to start with the video. This is your cue to begin to play the video. I have a bullet train from New York to D.C. It always brings me back to when I first started making this commute. In 2019, I was a freshman in the most diverse Congress in history. Up to that point, it was a critical time. I'll never forget the children in our community. They were so inspired to see this new class of politicians who reflected them navigating the halls of power. It's often said, you can't be what you can't see. And for the first time, they saw themselves. I think there was something similar with the Green New Deal. We knew that we needed to save the planet and that we had all the technology to do it, but people were scared. They said it was too big, too fast, not practical. I think that's because they just couldn't picture it yet. Anyways, I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's start with how we got here. 1977, New York. A senior scientist named James Black made a presentation about how burning fossil fuels could eventually lead to global temperatures rising four or five degrees Fahrenheit. Within two years, one of the world's biggest super tankers was outfitted with a state-of-the-art lab to measure CO2 in the ocean, gathering more data about global warming. Guess who was doing all of this research? Exxon Mobil, the oil and gas company. Oh yeah, Exxon knew this whole time, as did our politicians. Ten years later, James Hansen, NASA's top climate scientist, told Congress he was 99% certain that global warming was happening and caused by humans. That was 1988, the year before I was even born. So did Exxon listen to the science, including their own? Did they change business models, invest in renewables? No, the opposite. They knew and they doubled down. 
They and others spent millions setting up a network of lobby groups and think tanks to create doubt and denial about climate change. It was an effort designed to attack and dispute the very kind of science they themselves had been doing. And it worked. Politicians went to bat for fossil fuels and these massive corporations kept digging and mining, drilling and fracking like there was no tomorrow. America became the biggest producer and consumer of oil in the world. Fossil fuel companies made hundreds of billions while the public paid the lion's share to clean up their disasters. We lost a generation of time we'll never get back. Entire species will never get back. Natural wonders gone forever. And in 2017, Hurricane Maria destroyed the place where my family was from, Puerto Rico. It was like a climate bomb. It took as many American lives as 9-11. And in the next year, when I was elected to Congress, the world's leading climate scientists declared another emergency. They told us that we had 12 years left to cut our emissions in half, or hundreds of millions of people would be more likely to face food and water shortages, poverty, and death. 12 years to change everything. How we got around, how we fed ourselves, how we made our stuff, how we lived and worked, everything. The only way to do it was to transform our economy, which we already knew was broken since the vast majority of wealth was going to just a small handful of people and most folks were falling further and further behind. It was a true turning point. Lots of people gave up. They said we were doomed. But some of us remembered that as a nation, we'd been in peril before. The Great Depression, World War II. We knew from our history how to pull together to overcome impossible odds. And at the very least, we owed it to our children to try. The wave began when Democrats took back the House in 2018, and then the Senate and the White House in 2020, and launched the decade of the Green New Deal, a flurry of legislation that kicked off our social and ecological transformation to save the planet. It was the kind of swing for the fence ambition we needed. Finally, we were entertaining solutions on the scale of the crises we faced without leaving anyone behind. That included Medicare for All, the most popular social program in American history. We also introduced the federal jobs guarantee, a public option including dignified living wages for work. Funnily enough, the biggest problem in those early years was a labor shortage. We were building a national smart grid, retrofitting every building in America, putting trains like this one all across the country. We needed more workers. That group of kids from my neighborhood were right in the middle of it all, especially this one girl, Ileana. Her first job out of college was with AmeriCorps Climate, restoring wetlands and bayous in coastal Louisiana. Most of her friends were in her union, including some oil workers in transition. They took apart old pipelines and got to work planting mangroves with the same salary and benefits. Of course, when it came to healing the land, we had huge gaps in our knowledge. Luckily, indigenous communities offered generational expertise to help guide the way. Ileana got restless, tried her hand as a solar plant engineer for a while, but eventually made her career in raising the next generation as part of the Universal Child Care Initiative. As it turns out, caring for others is valuable, low-carbon work, and we started paying real money to folks like teachers, domestic workers, and home health aides. Those were years of massive change, and not all of it was good. When Hurricane Sheldon hit Southern Florida, Parts of Miami went underwater for the last time. But as we battled the floods, fires, and droughts, we knew how lucky we were to have started acting when we did. And we didn't just change the infrastructure, we changed how we did things. We became a society that was not only modern and wealthy, but dignified and humane too. By committing to universal rights like healthcare and meaningful work for all, we stopped being so scared of the future. We stopped being scared of each other, and we found our shared purpose. Ileana heard the call too, and in 2028, she ran for office in the first cycle of publicly funded election campaigns. And now she occupies the seat that I once held. 
I couldn't be more proud of her, a true child of the Green New Deal. When I think back to my first term in Congress, writing that old school Amtrak in 2019, all of this was still ahead of us. And the first big step was just closing our eyes and imagining it. We can be whatever we have the courage to see. How are we doing? Wow. It is so great to see all of you here. Um, and it's always nice to see that video, which many of us saw on tiny little screens um, on a big screen. Um, and, uh, and I just want to acknowledge, as you saw quickly in the credits, that um, my amazing uh, husband, partner in all things, Avi Lewis, was the producer on that and also the co-writer and worked with AOC at every step of the way to turn it into a reality. So yay, Avi, wherever you are. Yes. Um, well, welcome to the Canadian launch of On Fire. Uh, it is so wonderful to share, to share this evening with you. Um, as you her, uh, heard, um, I'm in the States for a little while. I'm teaching at Rutgers University. It is, um, a, it is a three year stint and I really miss this city. Um, and it's just wonderful to be home. And, and at the AGO, this incredible institution, uh, I want to thank Deviani for, for hosting us, Ishmael for being in conversation with me, my local bookshop, another story, um, for being here. Uh, and these are really like in the audience as I look around, it's really my, my acknowledgments come to life. Um, so bear with me as I thank some incredibly important people in my life. Uh, um, first of all, Louise Dennis, who is, uh, I am just so blessed to work with her as my editor and publisher. It's very rare in publishing today to have, um, really a lifelong relationship with a single editor. And Louise published No Logo um, 20 years ago, and we've been working together on every book ever since. And that is rarer than you think. <laughs> so Louise, I love you. Thank you for being here. You are just an icon, an icon in this country. Um, and Sharon Cook, also uh, at Penguin Random House. I don't think we've added any other conglomerates to the name since I last checked. Um, uh, and, and Sharon also, we've been on this journey for so long, um, and it's, it's, it's really great, you know, we launched This Changes Everything together a few years ago, and even just to see the, the difference in the way certain ideas are received and metabolized, and ideas that seem, oh, wacky, crazy, impossible a few years ago seem, um, well, isn't it too late for that? I mean, haven't we completely screwed up? <laughs> anyway, the debate changes, but what never changes is the Canadian media telling you it's impossible. Um, uh, I want to um, thank and acknowledge my absolutely incredible mother-in-law, Michelle Landsberg, who is here. We adore her. Yes. Um, I see her next to Judy Rebick. I mean, so many incredible fighters uh, and, and the women who, who laid the path that I walk on. Um, I mentioned Avi. Uh, he is also here tonight. Our son, Toma, um, probably has left by now. Um, <laughs> But just in case, Toma, you're the best. You really put up with a lot. Um, and I just want to take a minute to thank Jackie Joyner. Uh, Jackie Joyner is the manager of Klein Lewis Productions. Um, Klein Lewis Productions is just me, Jackie, and Uppy, um, which means <laughs> that Jackie just runs everything and makes everything happen. Um, and Another um, extraordinary thing is that I've been working with Jackie for 17 years. Um, that's also something that doesn't happen very much. So I just feel so blessed to have had these long relationships and to have these people who are so important to me in the room today. So thank you. Um, yay. All right. The world's on fire. Let's get to it, right? Um, I, I spent the day talking to journalists, and it's so interesting because um, I, 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 I often get a lot of questions like, how can you be hopeful, right? How is it possible? And, um, you know, I don't see myself as hopeful in this moment. That's not, 
the main emotion I feel um, on a day-to-day -day basis. I feel a lot of different emotions going through the day and even in any given hour. Um, you know, I feel a sense of raw terror, existential dread, um, uh, overwhelm, um, and yeah, I do feel some hope. Um, and I'm going to talk about why I do and what I see shifting. And you know, and I think hope is something that we earn. I don't think it's just a sort of state of stasis, a state of being that we lay claim to and say that we're hopeful. I think we have to earn it with our actions. And I think there are a lot of people earning that right now, especially today. So we will talk about that. But I certainly do feel the weight of our moment in history. Um, and I suspect that there are many of you who feel the same way, who understand that we are alive and breathing at the last possible moment when the things we do will determine whether or not we have a habitable future for people who are alive today on the planet. Um, a year ago, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which is the foremost scientific body charged with coming to a consensus that informs what governments should do about climate change, giving them a synthesis of thousands of peer-reviewed articles to say, this is where we're at. And if a year ago, they put out a, uh, um, a report uh, about keeping temperatures below, keeping warming below uh, uh, levels of 1.5 degrees Celsius. We've warmed the planet by one degree Celsius, and we are seeing the impacts of that already. They said it would make a lot of sense <laughs> to try to keep it below 1.5, given what we're seeing at one degree and how quickly it is tipping. Um, and they said that if we have, want to give ourselves a fighting chance of doing that, we need to cut global emissions by 45% in 12 years. That is now 11 years, because that was a year ago. Next year, it'll be 10 years. That's the thing that happens with time. And so, so we are at this moment when everything is on the line. And in the summary of the report, they said very clearly, this is not something that is going to be done with a single carbon-based policy, like a tax or cap and trade. Not that that's not something we should do. But they said it will take unprecedented, this is a quote, and scientists don't usually speak so directly, so we should pay attention, unprecedented transformation in every aspect of society. And then they went on to list those aspects of society energy, transportation, buildings, agriculture, and so on. Changing everything, in other words. So here we are at that moment when we have this window, and we have engineers at Stanford University saying, you know, with breakthroughs in renewable technology and, and, and battery storage, we actually could get to 100% renewable energy. We would have to change a lot of things, and we would have to consume less, those of us who overconsume. It is possible to do it, though. And yet, at this very moment, when we have this last chance, the planetary arsonists have risen to the top job in country after country. Donald Trump, Jair Bolsonaro, Lesser known is Scott Morrison in Australia, a man who once walked into his parliament holding a piece of coal um, and talking about how great it would, was and why Australia should be allowed to dig the world's biggest coal mine. Um, we have Modi in India, Duterte in the Philippines. Um, and we are seeing you know, a formula emerging from these strong men figures, which is a very sharp definition of a sort of insider protected group, right? The real Americans, or the real Indians, um, and, or the real Australians, and we're seeing it in Europe, the real Europeans, and, and sharply defining that insider group worthy of protection. And then there are the outgroups, the others, inside these countries' borders and also on the borders, especially on the borders. And these are the threats, the frightening other, the diseased, the security risk, the terrorist, the rapist, all of this, the invader, most of all, right? And so I see these two forces as two fires that are really feeding each other. And I don't think it is a coincidence that at the moment that 
climate change shifts from being this sort of future th threat off in the distance to a banging down the door lived reality for people around the world, including in this country, who breathe wildfire smoke summer after summer on the West Coast, who deal with flooding in the center of the country, unprecedented storms on the East Coast. We're in it, and I don't think it's a coincidence that as we are in it, as we really understand that we are entering these turbulent times, that these strong men, far-right figures are coming along and turning us against each other, right? And saying, you will be protected, you will not. And in the book, I call this climate barbarism because I think that's what it is. And I don't think it matters whether these guys say they believe in climate change or they don't believe in climate change. By the way, they all know climate change is real. Donald Trump has had to modify his golf courses. They know, right? <laughs> they have a different approach to how they want to adapt to climate change. So we have these two fires, but I believe, I really, really believe that we live in a time of three fires, that there is a third fire that has ignited. And we saw it today, and it burned so bright. Annie, do you want to show a couple of the slides for those of you who weren't on Twitter all day? <laughs> <laughs> Today, today was the largest climate action in the history of this planet. And it was led by young people. It was led by people who are still in high school and middle school. <laughs> they made this happen. They invited the adults to join them. It was overwhelmingly adults, but it wasn't just adults. There were thousands of workers at big tech companies who for the first time in the history of Silicon Valley walked off the job at Amazon, Microsoft, not with the sanction of their employers, at Google, um, demanding that these companies that talk a good game um, get to zero emissions themselves, stop doing contracts with fossil fuel companies, stop donating money to fossil fuel denying, to climate change denying uh, politicians. This has been an incredible day. Are we just like flipping through some of these? Yeah. So, no, this is our moment. It is a moment of three fires, and our job, if we want to know <laughs> what we need to be focused on, it isn't figuring out, are we going to win, and wringing our hands, and what are our chances? We're all in this. There's no spare planet anyone's going to, even serious centrist journalists, you know, who work at the CBC. We're all here. <laughs> We're all in it. You know, we can all put the devil's advocate questions to each other, and all of it is a massive waste of time, because the only thing that matters is if there's any chance, what is each and every one of us doing to improve the chances? That's all that matters. That's the only discussion that we should be having. And I want to just finish up, because I'm really excited to, to talk to Ishmael, just with a really short reading from the introduction <clears throat> of this book. OK. Uh, the rapidly escalating cruelty of our present moment cannot be overstated nor can the long-term damage to the collective psyche should this go unchallenged. Beneath the theater of some governments denying climate change and others claiming to be doing something about it while they fortress their borders from its effects, there is one overarching question facing us. In the rough and rocky future that has already begun, what kind of people are we going to be? Will we share what's left and try to look after one another or are we instead going to attempt to hoard what's left, look after our own, and lock everyone else out? In this time of rising seas and rising fascism, these are the stark choices before us. There are options besides full-blown climate barbarism, but given how far down that road we are, there is no point pretending that they are easy. It's going to take a lot more than a carbon tax or cap and trade. It's going to take an all-out war on pollution and poverty and racism and colonialism and despair all at once. The message coming from the school strikes is that a great many young people are ready for this kind of deep change. They know all too well that the sixth mass extinction is not the only crisis they have inherited. They are also growing up in the rubble of market euphoria 
in which the dreams of endlessly rising living standards have given way to rampant austerity and economic insecurity. And techno-utopianism, which imagined a frictionless future of limitless connection and community, has morphed into addiction to the algorithms of envy, relentless corporate surveillance, and spiraling online misogyny and white supremacy. This is a quote from Greta. Once you have done your homework, you realize that we need new politics. We need a new e economics, where everything is based on our rapidly declining and extremely limited carbon budget. But that is not enough. We need a whole new way of thinking. We must stop competing with each other. We need to start cooperating and sharing the remaining resources of this planet in a fair way. And I was really struck that the dish with two spoons covenant says exactly that, that what we are bound to do, we who live on this land, is peacefully share for and care for the resources of this land. Because our house is on fire, and this should come as no surprise, built on false promises, discounted futures, and sacrificial people, it was rigged to blow from the start. It's too late to save all of our stuff, but we can still save each other and a great many other species too. Let's put out the flames and build something different in its place, something a little less ornate, but with room for all of those who need shelter and care. Thank you. Thank you for that rousing speech, and thank you to the AGO for hosting this. We agreed beforehand that this was my best side, so that's why I'm sitting on this side. Um, I think it's really fitting that this talk is happening on this day with all this activism happening, and you actually open your book focusing on these youth climate activists. When you speak to young people who are in this fight, how is their understanding of the climate crisis different, or how are those conversations different than when you're speaking to older people? I think the, um, so I think the biggest difference is the, that the young activists who I, sp who I speak to, whether they're young climate strikers in high school, or whether it's um, the leaders of the Sunrise Movement in the United States, or whether it's our time here in Canada, who have been organizing voters to elect climate champions, and we can talk about that, we have to do that. Um, they are so much less afraid of connecting the dots with other issues. You know, when I talk to a lot of older climate activists, there was honestly really, there's, there's still honestly, is a, is a really strong sense. And it's, it's horrible to say, but some of them say it out loud. In fact, one of them wrote it in a review of my book in Nature that they, they really think that it hurts the climate cause to basically weigh it down with all this justice stuff, you know? That they think climate is more winnable than fighting poverty and fighting for healthcare. And they, they believe that if we can have a narrow climate approach, um, it's more winnable. And I really don't understand why they believe that, because they've been trying that for the past 30 years. <laughs> um, and actually, more and more, the more unjust our system becomes, the more backlash that produces. I mean, the extreme example is France with Macron and the carbon, you know, the, the price on, uh, uh, the, car, the tax on petrol that, you know, offloaded the costs of climate action onto working people who are already overburdened while he's handing out tax breaks to, to millionaires and corporations. And lo and behold, you have an uprising and lo and behold, you no longer have that carbon tax because you have to, you know, it's, 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 it's untenable, and, and we lose years we don't have, right? But here in Ontario, we saw something very similar, right? People came to associate climate action with, you know, higher electricity bills. Some of it was misinformation. Not all of it was, right? We haven't centered justice. We haven't centered jobs. We haven't centered things that actually make people's lives better, right? Where they can, they can see right away how this helps. And you and I were just talking, like, after, you know, an NDP government in, in Alberta and, you know, a, a first term of the Liberals, the big 
the big win is like, we got a carbon tax, you know, we got carbon pricing. And that, like, that doesn't get people excited. Like, what gets people excited is like beautiful, affordable, low carbon housing, like they're building in Paris, you know, or incredible, you know, electrical powered public transit that is affordable and maybe even free. And it's just like, wow, this is like helping my life. And I may need to change, but these are tangible benefits. Mm -hmm. Well, anyway, I, I didn't really answer, but like, I, I mean, I think <laughs> the biggest change is like young people are hungry for connections. Right. They're hungry for connections. They have an inter intersectional lens and they don't want to, they don't want to leave their friends out or they don't want to leave parts of themselves out, you know? Mm -hmm. Are they also, are we the frogs that have slowly been boiled and they, because of their youth, are the frogs being tossed in and, and their, their political awakening is they look around and everything is, it's gotten so far. And, yes. and do you think they have a greater sense of urgency because they're living through it? Okay, yes, yeah, for sure. I mean, these are kids who, you know, have missed multiple school days because of smoke, right? Or flooding, um, you, know, or who, you know, whose lungs have been impacted by dirty industry compounded by, by wildfire smoke. You know, a lot of people on the West Coast are experiencing this. Um, I have a complicated relationship with the frog in boiling water because I do feel like we've been trying to jump, you know, and when I look at, you know, when I, when I look at the sort of the history of climate, climate, you know, mobilization and awareness, it is this, you know, it's this kind of roller coaster graph where like, you know, people will learn about it right before the Rio Earth Summit and go like, we're really, really, really going to act and, you know, and people want to act and they want to change and they organize and they mobilize and this is just starting in the recent wave, you know, we could go back further. Um, and then, or, you know, the inconvenient truth moment, right, where, it, 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 you know, it's like the top issue and people really want to change. I feel like we have to talk about the forces that like put the lid back on the pot, you know, <laughs> and because I don't think it isn't that we haven't tried. I think that there are things that have undermined that survival mechanism, including the doubt campaigns, the misinformation campaigns that, that, that we talk about in the film. But another one is, you know, if you look at that graph, what you see is people's interest in climate action peaks during economic booms and it plummets during economic recessions, right? And that's what happened, you know, the high point, you know, inconvenient truth, Al Gore wins the Nobel Prize, world economy collapses, what climate, you know? Um, and that's because we have tended to put forward policies that, that do make climate seem like a kind of a luxury issue. You'll pay a little bit more, right? Oh, well, things are going well, I can afford to pay a little bit more. But then when things collapse, suddenly, no. And that's, I think, the game changer of a, of, of a Green New Deal approach, is that this is specifically named after the most famous economic stimulus of all time that was a response to the biggest economic crisis in capitalism's history, the Great Depression. And so that means that if we do enter a recession, which we will in the next few years, we don't get derailed. This actually becomes even more pressing. Like, yeah, we need, we need an economic stimulus that's going to create millions of jobs and we can get to 100% renewable energy in the process. So I think this is our first kind of recession-proof paradigm, which is really important. Right. In the case that you make in the book, um, you do, in a way, try to anticipate all of the arguments against, you know, the fact that it is recession-proof and that it is a job creator. Um, I think here in Canada, though, or certainly when I first saw the book and I saw the subtitle, The Burning Case for a Green New Deal, I thought, Hold on, this sounds familiar. I feel like in Canada we had a conversation about the LEAP Manifesto just a few years ago that I know you were involved with. And it was making some of the very same arguments. But there was a pretty strong backlash mm -hmm. to the LEAP Manifesto. Yeah. And not to say there hasn't been a backlash to the Green New Deal, but it feels like it's on a different scale. Would you agree? Um. Yeah, I mean, I think the difference, the ideas in the Green New Deal resolution that Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and Ed Markey put forward and that we're now seeing different iterations of in the European Union, here in Canada, they didn't come up with that framework themselves. It came from social movements, um, of which the leap is a part, you know, as part of a global climate justice movement that has, has been demanding precisely this kind of justice-based transition um, that 
leaves no workers behind that 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 says that the frontline communities indigenous communities black and brown communities that have had the dirty industries in their backyards destroying their lands should be first in line to benefit from the transition to get the jobs to own the renewable energy these ideas have been in the movement but where they weren't was in politics and in canada as you say they almost were they almost were um, there was a convention or something where supposedly that was good. One of the parties was going to really run with it, but then that didn't happen. So look, all I can say is bygones, you know, um, I'm glad that the NDP and the Greens are like full on with the Green New Deal now. Better late than never. Let's get this thing going. Um, and it's getting better and better and more specific. You know, the resolution, the AOC Markey resolution came out. It was just a few pages. Now we have Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren putting out hundreds of pages of specific policies about what this would mean. Um, so it's all part of a process. It's all a journey. We didn't invent it at the leap. You know, in This Changes Everything, I begin with a quote from a Bolivian climate change negotiator, a young woman named Angelica Navarro, who went to the UN exactly, exactly 10 years ago in 2009 and called for a Marshall Plan for Planet Earth. Um, which was, a, you know, basically a Green New Deal, <laughs> right? So we're all, we're all building on each other's work all the time. <laughs> do you think, because we're in Canada, I'm doing a few Canadian questions. Do Look, I, I hope yes. that's okay. I hear it's been an interesting few days. <laughs> right. <laughs> Has anything happened in Canadian politics? Um, you tell me, Ishmael. <laughs> I hear you wrote something about it just now. <laughs> well, um, we can talk about that, but... Let's do it. I mean, do you want us to talk about it? Or, yeah, we should talk about it. Okay. I mean, look, we have to talk about it. We have to, because it's connected, actually. It is connected. So, so it is connected, right? Because as we were talking about before, um, beforehand, I think it was striking that this happened at an elite, you know, private school in Vancouver. It happened to the son of a prime minister who grew up in the lap of luxury and lived a very privileged life. And, and does this episode say something about um, how... Close it, the private schools. Close them all. <laughs> how we should, yeah. we should add that to the Green New Deal. Close all the private schools. It's, nothing good comes from that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but what do you think this episode does say about the larger picture and, and the various things that the, a Green New Deal tries to address across social justice, environmental justice, economic justice? Well, I mean, I think it's interesting because I think it's, a, I, yeah, I did some interviews with, with journalists today in Canada and it was sort of like, there was this, like this was going to be the climate change election, but I guess not. Now it's going to be the racism election, you know, and it should be a racism election. It, it, we should be talking about racism a lot more in this country. Um, but... You know, the, the, I think the whole point of having a completely different lens for how we respond to the climate crisis that is much more holistic, that is really about, okay, if we're going to listen to the scientists and change the building blocks of our economy, um, why wouldn't we also try to make it a hell of a lot fairer and tackle the systemic injustices that date back to the founding of our country? Because we're changing stuff anyway, right? What, why would we just decide to decarbonize it but build it back exactly the same? You know, so I think that um, if we really do understand the scope of what, we're t of what we're talking about here with the Green New Deal, then it doesn't get derailed. It, in fact, is an argument for the, the, ha having deeper responses to entrenched racism in this country beyond the sort of symbolic... Um, you know, the politics of symbolism that the liberals do so very well, right? When they're not, except when they're not. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but look, it would be, but I mean, I do think it's also related in the sense that, you know, I think a lot of the frustration with the Trudeau government has to do with this huge gap between the sort of image projected and, and the reality. And this, what these videos and images have done is pulled back the curtain, right? Um, but, you know, this is also what we have been screaming about in the climate movement for a long time. It's like, no, we're not going to pay for the windmills by 
you know, increasing capacity in the tar sands by 40%, right? You, that's not climate leadership. That is torching the planet. Um, you know, you can't split the difference with physics and chemistry, and that's what they've been trying to do in that special way. Um, and indigenous, you know, indigenous communities across the country have been saying the same thing, like, you know, it's not enough to have the tattoo. It is not enough to visit, you know, the teepee. Like, you, you, you are violating indigenous rights systematically across this country. And so I think that, yeah, the liberals have a crisis of credibility, and it would be a terrible shame if the result of that was to go and elect, um, you know, a leader who has aligned himself repeatedly with actual white supremacists in this country. That is not the response that we need to, the, to this crisis. Um, you know, so I think what we need to be is very, very strategic. I think the best case scenario is to have a minority government, to have a coalition where the liberals are forced to make alliances with the Greens and the NDP. Um, I, I think giving liberals a blank slate is a really bad idea. We've seen this. We were never supposed to have a first-past-the-post election again, and yet here we are, right? So let's force some proportional representation on them. And, you know, what that means is, I, you know, we, there can't be just a knee-jerk, okay, let's just uh, have a liberal sweep because we don't want sheer. We have to be strategic. And we're really lucky because there is a great group called um, uh, Our Time, and you can go to their website, um, where they have done a lot of research about who the real champions are, who the intersectional climate champions are, people who would really bring in a Green New Deal, who are serious about racial injustice and gender exclusion and listening to scientists when it, and indigenous knowledge when it comes to climate change. And they're identifying really strong candidates. And one thing I can say after a year of living in the States, um, and you know, Avi and I you know, working with some of the really terrific folks who have put the Green New Deal on the map, um, is that it wasn't because the leadership of the Democratic Party wanted this. Oh, no, they did not. Nancy Pelosi has been negative about this from day one. She's been utterly dismissive. She calls it the green dream or whatever. This is happening because a cohort of insurgent, radical congresswomen of color were elected, um, and they took on the leadership of the Democratic Party, and also because an outside group um, crashed the party bef you know, b before they were even inaugurated and occupied Nancy Pelosi's office, that's the Sunrise Movement, and were visited by Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, supported by Rashida, Rashida Tlaib, um, and Ayanna Presley and Ilhan Omar. And um, that's what's changed the game, and now here we are, um, Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren, Kamala Harris, Cory Booker, like everybody except Biden, basically, ha is, is supporting the Green New Deal, and they're outdoing each other for who's going to spend more trillions of dollars. So the point is, elect some climate champions. Do your research and find out who, who really needs our help. Min Suk Lee is amazing. People should work for her. Get her elected wherever you live in Toronto. Paul Taylor is fantastic. Paul um, you know, in my old riding, soon to be my new riding again. Um, you know, in, in other parts of Ontario, Matthew Green in Hamilton, he's fantastic. Sven Robinson, I believe in Sven Robinson. I'm glad he's coming back. So there are a lot of races that we can get behind. These are just people who I know personally. Um, but go to our time and, you know, let's, let's, let's see if we can get let's see if we can get a minority government that can't afford not to listen to people this time. Mm -hmm. So, shifting gears just a little bit, but still sort of related to Canadian politics. This quote from Trudeau, which I'm sure you're familiar with, Trudeau famously said, no country would find 173 barrels of oil in the ground and leave it there. You write in the book about this notion that we have that nature is inexhaustible, our appetites are uncurbable, yeah. the natural world is there for us to you know, ravage and destroy, and that we basically can't run out of nature. Um, how, do you, how do you think that has developed into this near religion in the Anglosphere uh, that you write about? Um, well, well, I do think, you know, Going back to the sort of um, the the sort of resource cornucopia um, 
enthusiasm <laughs> that you hear in all of the sort of early writings about this country that came to be called Canada, right? I mean, I sort of, I find it sort of worth pausing over the idea that, you know, you name, you name like a place New France, for instance. Like, that's just interesting. Like, hey, we found another France. Um, <laughs> it's bigger and has more trees and fish and animals. So we'll never run out. Like, I, I, you know, that's the whole idea. Um, new France, New Amsterdam, you know. Um, new England, New South Wales. It's just like extra supersized Europe's that they went around just claiming. Um, and it was nature beyond, beyond the realm of, of European imaginings. Um, it's inextricable from the brutality uh, and, the, and the, 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 sci the supposedly scientific racism that rationalized the, the violent theft of this land from indigenous people and ideas like Manifest Destiny, Terra Nullius, um, that ranked human life and said, well, those lives don't really count, so we're going to take that land, and other lives don't count, so we are going to turn those people into slaves to work that land. And Canadians tell, uh, like to tell ourselves that we weren't you know, integral to the slave economy, but we were, because not only were there slaves in Canada, but the, the seemingly inexhaustible cod, um, which they were really excited about, um, you know, and it really was the engine of the early Canadian economy, that and beavers, um, you know, that cod was dried and it was the primary source of protein um, in, 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 the, in the West Indies and in the Caribbean um, for plantation owners. And we were, you know, absolutely integral to the, to the slave economy. So these systems of of, of ranking human, re the relative value of human life based on skin color, um, they're very profitable, right? I mean, and, and they, they come along when they, when they are needed. They surge when they are needed in order to justify really barbaric policies. And they never go away. I think they kind of go dormant because they're never fully con confronted. And this is what I was saying about earlier about why I think it isn't a coincidence that we are seeing this surge in unmasked white supremacy in this moment, because now it is being used to justify the fortressing of these same continents. Um, so I think we need to, we, you know, I think we need to, to, to understand this. I think we need new stories because the old ones aren't going away. And, and you know, as Trudeau talked about, talks about the, the, the Kinder Morgan pipeline expansion as nation building. So I think this idea that our nation is still you know, intimately linked with the, the, the endless exhaustion of resources is not something we've reckoned with. Mm -hmm. This book covers um, 10 years of ideas and speeches and, and writing that you've done on this topic. Did anything change for you over the course of that time in your own thinking about climate change and maybe even uh, some of the ideas of the left in thinking about climate change? Um, yeah, so it, it does cover 10 years and um, you know, it ha it's about a third of it is new writing, sort of framing it. But yeah, when I look at those, like the earlier essays, it's definitely more, um, you know, I think, um, confirming my own worldview, really, of just like, you know, I'm somebody who has a pretty strong critique of you know, neoliberal capitalism, as people know, and it was really clear to me as I started, you know, immersing myself in, in the climate literature that there was a really big gap in how people were talking about climate change because we weren't talking about this clash between what we need to do in the face of the climate crisis, which is invest in the public sphere, which is manage our economies in a more deliberate way, um, you know, and the, the neoliberal project, which is all about dismantling the public sphere, waging war on the collective, privatizing it, cutting taxes, and you know, all, none of this is compatible with a massive public works project that we have on our hands. So I think I saw that really clearly, but I don't think I saw um, as clearly, and, and it took me a while to really kind of reckon with the way it challenged the, um, you know, traditional ideas of the, of, the, of the sort of social democratic left, which was still based on endless extraction of nature, but 
was, you know, had different ideas about how that wealth should be redistributed, like fighting poverty and other good things that I still support, but it, but it, it wasn't really reckoning with natural limits. And so I think that that pushed me like to where we, what we were just talking about of sort of digging deeper and trying to understand, you know, what are the sort of deep stories that, that are, that are you know, intimately connected to the kind of economy that was built in the first place about our um, supposed right to dominate nature, to treat nature as a machine, um, and to put certain humans in the, at the top of the hierarchy as the sort of boss or engineer of nature, the sort of Francis Bacon um, ideas of like holding nature down by the hair and so other rape fantasies. Um, and so I think, yeah, I think, I think my ideas have changed in that. I think I, I think I understand or I'm more interested in and still learning about the connections between the hatred of women and this system. I think it's something I haven't written enough about, but, you know, when I look at a figure like Bolsonaro, who one minute is, you know, like he's saying, the Amazon is our virgin, our virgin, back off, we get to rape her, right? And then, you know, when Emmanuel Macron is, uh, you know, criticizing him for not doing enough to fight the fires, he insults Emmanuel Macron's wife's looks. And this is somebody who was elected, um, you know, riling up hysteria about what in Brazil they call gender ideology. And it's a huge, they, they, they really weaponized transphobia during the election. And it was all about, you know, turning your kids trans, turning your kids gay. They're quoting Judith Butler in their campaign literature. I mean, it was really strange stuff. Um, but, you know, I spoke to Fernando Haddad. I interviewed him, who is his, the person who ran against him and lost. And he's absolutely sure that that is, that is why he lost. Uh, because he was education minister under Lula or Dilma. I'm not sure which one. But he was education minister, so he was, they were saying this is the one who was doing this sex education um, and, 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 and doing this to your children. And it is worth remembering that Doug Ford, that guy, you know, he also won an election, uh, uh, you know, with a buck of beer and we'll roll back sex education, right? So it's all really connected for these guys. And that's why to me it is so maddening when my friends in the climate movement are so resistant to building an intersectional climate movement because it's really intersectional for Doug Four. <laughs> and, <laughs> you know, it is. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm going to apologize to Kimberly Crenshaw for using that word in that context. I take it back. Um, but, no, they have, they, uh, for them, they see the connections between their economic project, their racial project, their gender project. It is a holistic worldview. And we need one, too. So I think that, that takes us to calling it a Green New Deal to begin with, mm -hmm. because the original New Deal did um, do lots of great things and, and stopped the Depression and gave lots of people work, but it is also criticized for not having um, employed as many uh, black people or people of color. Jobs primarily went to white men, women were shut out, there was, so there was lots of shortcomings. So how would one ensure that a Green New Deal doesn't repeat the mistakes of its namesake? It's a great question. Um, and the, 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 the resolution that, that Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and Ed Markey um, wrote talks specifically about, about those exclusions. And you know, this is why I think there's so much language about frontline communities and, um, and defines them very specifically as, as communities who were excluded from the benefits of the original New Deal. Um, there's a really important book written about the New Deal called When Affirmative Action Was White, about looking at the, the New Deal and also the, some of the um, World War II era public investments as being this huge affirmative action program for white workers because black workers were so systematically excluded. It was also a period when many Mexicans were being deported in the United States. You mentioned Women workers, domestic workers were excluded from any New Deal protections. Agricultural workers were excluded. Um, so then, I mean, it does raise the question of why even call it a New Deal if it 
was, you know, so profoundly um, you know, problematic isn't a strong enough word. I mean, it was racist in, in lots of ways. Um, and I've had a lot of discussions about why it is, what, why the, the pros and cons of invoking different historical moments. I mentioned that Angelica Navarro talks about the Marshall Plan for Planet Earth as a different analogy. Some people argue that a better analogy is the reconstruction period after the brief reconstruction period after the Civil War. Mm -hmm. um, some people talk about the World War II mobilizations as because, you know, in terms of industrial transformation, that is a better analogy than the New Deal. None of them are perfect. I don't love the wartime ones because they are so much more centrally controlled and administered. Um, what I like about the New Deal is that there was indeed a push and pull between social movements and, and, and government. Um, and, and, the important part of it, in addition to not repeating those exclusions and learning from them, I think is just, I really do believe that the biggest barrier we're up against is that people have, a lot of people have swallowed the neoliberal lie that we can't do big things together. And they've never had direct experience with it. I mean, I haven't really. I mean, I've lived, I've come of age, my entire life has been a period of dismantling the public sphere. Um, hacking it up, selling it off, um, vilification. And so when it, the Jonathan Franzens of the world come along and say, we're doomed, we're doomed, we just can't do it, um, that actually finds a, a, a ready audience because people don't have experience with collective action. And so I think with all of the heavy baggage that the New Deal carries, the fact that it reminds us of a moment when an economy transformed in nine years, created 10 million jobs, electrified rural America, set off an artistic renaissance, which unlike other programs, actually was some of the biggest investments made in African American artists in the history of the United States and indigenous artists. The Civilian Conservation Corps, which was a network of, um, of, of rural camps that went out to fight deforestation and soil erosion during the Dust Bowl, they planted 2.3 billion trees, which is half of the trees ever planted in the United States. So the scale of the thing, when you learn about it, right, tens of thousands of works of art, um, you know, thousands upon thousands of plays, including like really kind of avant-garde pieces, like, um, you know, an all-black cast of Othello. It's, um, it stretches our brains in a way that I think our brains need to be stretched and it makes us feel like maybe we're not doomed. Like maybe it isn't our human nature, it is the structures that we've been in and we could change those structures. So that's why I think that, that, that as admittedly flawed as it is, um, it's that sense of possibility and that, and that ability to harken back to an actual experience and not just a sort of a utopian vision off in the future is important enough that it's worth doing. Mm -hmm. yeah. that's, that's in addition, of course, to using paper straws, I believe, uh, which will do the bulk of the heavy lifting, I think. Um, so we only have a few minutes um, before I think uh, lots of people might want a signed book. But I, I appreciate the optimism with which you approach the subject matter. But I have to say that when I, you know, when I have images of um, the burning Amazon, you know, species disappearing, all of these things that, that really get you down, I wonder for you, what is your, your mind palace where you go to find some hope or optimism? What, what keeps you, what's giving you the most hope? Well, I mean, today is, today's easy. <laughs> today's easy. I mean, my goodness. I think they said that was the largest protest in Australia's history. Um, so, and by the way, that means we really need to, like, up our game, right? Because ours is in a week. We've got a whole extra week to get ready. Um, so... <laughs> so I think, okay, so what gives me the... the the most hope is the seriousness of this generation of organizers. Um, 
so in my time as a leftist, <laughs> I have been um, you know, privileged enough to be part of moments when suddenly things change. And, and there, there are these moments uh, like a political effervescence where just suddenly, like, it, 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 and, and, and they're magical and they're sort of mystical. The people who, who, who are at the center of it don't quite understand it. One minute, it's just like you and 15 friends going like, let's have a meeting. And then the next minute is Occupy Wall Street and like all of New York seems to be in the square with you. Or the movement of the squares in Spain and, 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 and Greece, which, which is not just like, it's not a march. The whole city's out there with you and they're not out there for a march. They're there all the time. And this is what happened during the Arab Spring as well. We're seeing it in Hong Kong. Um, you know, no one can predict when this will happen. You know, my friends who were part of the core organization of Occupy Wall Street, they were like, I don't know, we had a meeting a week before, no one showed up, you know? <laughs> and like, in Argent, we were, we, Avi and I were in Argentina um, in 2002 when this country that had, was sort of seen as like the most bourgeois country in Latin America, they didn't really have a strong left, you know, they were so, you know, middle class and apathetic, and then suddenly, you know, it was Kisivai and Todos, and they overthrew five presidents in three weeks. Um, so, so I know enough not to count people out, right? Puerto Rico, just now, <laughs> you know, overthrew their governor, another Kisivai and Todos moment. But I also know, I've also felt the heartbreak of losing those moments where the people were ready and we weren't ready, like with our plan, with what we actually wanted to do instead. And so this beautiful space that was opened up, um, a vacuum is created and who enters it? Well, a populist, you know, right-wing figure or, you know, or, or religious fanatics, you know? And this has happened too many times. And, you know, when I meet with the young organizers today, I feel them to be so determined to, not, to, to, to be ready for the opening and to have a plan. And that is what is happening now with the Green New Deal and this really, really hard intermovement work of people coming together and trying to come together with their yes. It is, let me tell you, like, it is not easy work. It is a lot easier to get together and say we all don't like Doug Ford. It is a lot harder to come together and try to figure out a positive platform. But the seriousness with which I see people doing it gives me so much hope. Um, because it means that if we get one of those moments of opening again, and I believe that we will, we will be ready this time. And uh, uh, the other thing I want to say is that, you know, I'm not, it's not that I have so much hope that we can actually, you know, get our emissions to zero in the time that we should. Uh, you know, I, I, I hope with everything I have that we will do that. But the kinds of intersectional responses that we've been talking about, why it is so important that we are investing in a truly universal health care, and we don't have truly universal health care in Canada, but truly universal health care, um, you know, in, in, in why we need to pay our teachers and resource our schools, why we need to know our neighbors, why we need to value indigenous knowledge and leadership and respect indigenous land rights. All of this becomes more important if things get even rockier, right? Because what, what scares me most, you know, is not the weather. It is the way people turn on each other if we do not invest in these relationships and these infrastructures of care. So it's kind of a no-lose, you know, if we make these investments. They're all the more important, actually, um, the rockier the future gets. So that, I don't know if that's hope, but something. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> the book is on fire. The burning case for the Green New Deal. Thank you, it's such a pleasure. Naomi Klein, everybody.